We're going to pick up here with the second part of error bounds. And hopefully you saw the first video on 11.2 because I'm going to take some of the information from there and apply it now to the material that we're doing in this section. So the stuff from 11.2, the first part, remember we had what we called the Lagrange form of an error bound. So the Lagrange form of an error bound look like this. The remainder that we got by stopping at a certain number of terms. So let's say we stopped at four terms in a Taylor polynomial. Then we would look at the fifth derivative, right? So the n plus first derivative evaluated at some c times x minus the center of the series to the n plus first power all over n plus one factorial. And it was this thing in the middle here, that, or the beginning, that was kind of goofy. We're trying to look for C to be what we call the worst case. So when we did that example, it was the last example of the last video. It dealt with the natural log. Okay, when we did those natural log problems, we came up with that negative 6 over x to the 4th. And rather than saying, should I plug in the 0.7 or the 1.3, I tried to phrase it in terms of, I'd like to find the maximum value of that n plus first derivative. So we're going to sort of think along those lines to say, could I rewrite this Lagrange form of the error bound a little bit different? And it turns out that when I do these error bounds, C really doesn't matter. This is very sad for C, but it turns out that C, the actual value of C, is not terribly relevant. What is relevant is the maximum value of the n plus first derivative. So that's going to lead us to something that we call the remainder estimation theorem. And the remainder estimation theorem basically uses m as the maximum value of the n plus first derivative on the given interval. So in the case of the natural log problem we did before, I had picked 0.7 to 1.3. That was the interval that was given in the problem. So I'm not looking for the maximum value of the n plus first derivative from like negative infinity to infinity. I'm only looking for the maximum value of the n plus first derivative on that given interval. So what does the remainder estimation theorem look like? It says this, the absolute value of the remainder by stopping at n terms is going to be less than or equal to the maximum value of the n plus first derivative times the absolute value of x minus a to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And this is a product. I guess I should put it in. It makes it look a little bit neater. Right? And again, these are absolute values, so I'm not caring whether it's above or below. I just want to know how far off it is. Now, check the textbook before you do the online homework because sometimes the textbook does something goofy and they round m to the nearest integer as, as you do problems on a test don't round m to the nearest integer round it to a couple of decimal places i'm going to do that here but when you do the online homework just be aware that sometimes the online program does goofy things and that's one of those goofy things is it rounds it to the nearest integer so suppose you did that natural log problem again using this remainder estimation theorem you realize not much changes instead of actually calculating through and figuring out what the c value is i could have just thrown this on a graphing calculator and said give me intervals of tenths between 0.7 and 1.3 i could have looked down the list and went oh 24.99 is the biggest value and thrown it in and never looked at that first column to figure out that it happened at 0.7 so it doesn't matter to me whether it happens at 0.7 or 0.8 or 1.3 it just matters what that maximum value is and that's what I use in the remainder estimation theorem. So let's take a look at this example. Suppose I say that I know that cosine of x is 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial. On the interval from negative 1 half to 1 half, can I find a maximum error, right? What is the error bound or the maximum error on that interval. Now here's the funny thing. What degree polynomial is this thing? Well, this is a second degree polynomial, but this is also a third degree polynomial. 
And so in cases where we have terms that are zero terms, in other words, the coefficient of x to the third in this case is just zero. So is this the second degree polynomial or is it the third degree polynomial? For the sake of counting and doing remainder estimation problems, we consider this to be a third degree polynomial because the coefficient of the x to the third is zero. So that's important because it's going to make a difference when you go to actually do those calculations. All right, so the remainder estimation theorem says that the remainder by stopping at degree three, the absolute value, is going to be less than or equal to the maximum value of the n plus first derivative, we'll get to that in a second, times x minus, well, look at this thing. This thing is centered at a equals zero. So it's going to be x minus zero to the three plus one, which is the fourth power, over four factorial. All right, let's see if we can figure out what the m is. So the m is the maximum value of the fourth derivative. Well, if the original function is cosine, right, if the original function is cosine of x, they know the first derivative is negative sine of x. The second derivative is negative cosine of x. The third derivative is sine of x. And the fourth derivative, strangely enough, brings us back to the cosine of x. All right, let's think of cosine of x values from negative 1 half to 1 half. Well, in this case, it turns out the maximum value is right there when x is equal to 0. Because when x is equal to 0, the cosine of 0 is 1. So the maximum value of the m plus first derivative, in this case, is 1. All right, so I'm looking for the maximum value for cosine on the interval from negative 1 half to 1 half. Well, remember what the cosine function does, right? It's at its highest point here, and then it goes down on either side. So if I want the maximum value, the maximum value right there is 1. All right, so let's throw it in here and see what we get. The remainder, by stopping at three terms, has to be less than or equal to 1 times something to the fourth over 4 factorial. Well, what should I put in here? for x. Should I put in a negative 1 half? Should I put in a 0? Should I put in a 1 half? Turns out 1 half is the best choice, although negative 1 half will work too, right? When you square, when you raise a negative to a fourth power, you get a positive anyhow. All right, so this is going to be a small number. 1 half to the fourth is going to be 1 16th, and I'm going to multiply that by 1 24th, and when I multiply the two of those, it should be roughly 400. 16 times 24 gives me 384. So this will give me 1 over 384. So I just use the remainder estimation theorem to figure out that this is the error bound. The error will be no more than 1 over 384. You want a decimal approximation for that? Let's do it. 1 over 384, I get as 0 0.002604. All right. Is that good or is that no good? Let's find out. All right. Let's go back to good old Desmos and let's see where my screen is. All right. So I end up with y equals the cosine of x. And then the other version, let's call this f of x. And then I will look at g of x equals 1 minus x squared over 2. And then h of x will be the absolute value of f of x minus g of x. I deselect the other two. And now, let's make a window based on the information that we have. So we said we wanted the x's to be from negative 1 half to 1 half. So then from negative 1 half to 1 half. And the y's, we could start this guy at 0. And we said the maximum value was 0 0.002604. Well, isn't that interesting? Look at that. Our graph goes all the way to the top of that window that we've set. 
So the actual maximum error has got to be real close to that 0.0026 that we came up with. And in fact, it is. If you actually went through and, and really zoomed in on it, you would find that it actually rounds out to 0.0026 to four decimal places. So one of the th reasons is because cosine doesn't do a whole lot, right? It goes between negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one. So when you come up with an approximation, the function doesn't have that big of a range. It only goes between negative one and one. So the error is not going to be that far off. So in this case, that remainder estimation theorem gave us a real good approximation for the error on the cosine function. And even just with two terms, right? One minus x squared over two gave us a real good approximation between negative one half and one half. All right. Let's do one more thing, which is actually one of my favorite things to do in this section. And that is, let's take a look at what we might get when we have an e to the x and we play around with it a little bit. All right, so let's say I started with e to the x. And we know that e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the third over 3 factorial. There are, by the way, some of these Taylor polynomials that you should have memorized. The 1 over 1 minus x is one of them. The expansions for sine and cosine are another one. And this e to the x one is another one. So there's a handful of them that you should know off the top of your head. And that is the list. All right, just for fun, let's replace those x's with i x's. So I get e to the i x equals and replace those x's with i x's. So i is the imaginary unit, right? Remember, i is the square root of negative 1. So then the next one becomes i x squared over 2 factorial. The next one becomes i x to the third over 3 factorial. The next one becomes i x to the fourth over 4 factorial, and I'll throw the fifth one in just for fun, and so forth. Okay, expand these out a little bit, and you're going to have to remember one of the rules for imaginary numbers. And one of the rules for imaginary numbers is that if you know that i is the square root of negative 1, then i squared is equal to negative 1 i to the fourth is equal to positive one, and i to the third is just the opposite of i. All right, so as you rewrite these things over here, then I'm going to end up with a one plus i x. Well, instead of an i squared, I'm going to put a negative one. So I'll have i squared x squared, but the i squared is negative one x squared over two factorial. Then remember we said i to the third is going to be negative i. So I'll get negative i x to the third over 3 factorial. i to the fourth is just 1. So I get x to the fourth over 4 factorial. Then i to the fifth is the same thing as i. So i to the fifth is the same thing as i. So I'll get i x to the fifth over 5 factorial, and so forth. And all of a sudden, stuff gets real. What stuff gets real? Well, every even power ends up becoming a real number. Let's take this then and separate them into two parts. So e to the i x, I'm going to put the real stuff over here, and then I'm going to put the imaginary stuff over there. So 1 is a real number. It goes here. x has the i that's attached to it, so I'm going to put the x over there. The minus x squared over 2 factorial is real, so it goes here. The next one has the i next to it, so I'll put the x to the third over 3 factorial over there. Then I'll get plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. Then I'll get over here a plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. And both of these will continue on and on. Okay. One of the reasons we memorize some of these Taylor polynomial formulas is because every once in a while we can take something that didn't originally look like a function that we recognize, and now all of a sudden we recognize it. So if you look at the 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial, you begin to realize that this guy over here is the cosine of x. And the other piece over here, all the odd terms, assemble to be the sine of x. Great. 
So I've reduced e to the i x, taken that formula, simplified it, and now I end up with a cosine plus the imaginary unit times sine. Okay, here's the pinnacle of this problem. Suppose I just decided eh, randomly to evaluate this at x equals pi. I would end up with an e to the i pi on the left-hand side, so I'd end up with an e to the i pi. On the other side, I would get the cosine of pi plus i times the sine of pi. Now, the sine of pi is just 0. So if the sine of pi is 0, that thing goes away. The cosine of pi is negative 1. And look what we've created. e to the i pi is equal to negative 1. Just pause for a minute and realize what we did. We took e, which is actually a number that's defined by a limit, and we've raised it to an imaginary power of pi, and the answer is a real number. Crazy stuff. Sometimes you'll also see it written like this, e to the i pi plus 1 is equal to 0. You realize that's exactly the same thing. They've taken the 1 and just moved it over to the other side. Sometimes they simply call this Euler's formula. Right? And is one of these things that would be tough to show just using other techniques, but using the Taylor series expansions just makes it real easy to see. So that's one of my favorite formulas. e to the i pi is negative 1 because, again, e is not even you know a constant like 2, 3, 4. It's a constant that comes from a limiting process. We call it sometimes a transcendental number. And we've raised that to an imaginary power of pi, and out of that comes a real number.